So I'm David, and that's Tom. And we work at Cycling 74, uh, and we develop Max and do other things with it. And today we're going to show you some experiments that we've been doing over the past few uh, months with the new version 8 of Max that we just released. And it has a new feature called MC which um, we use to create these. And uh, so maybe all you know about Max uh, is that um, it has boxes and you connect stuff with patch cords. So <laughs> that's probably all you're going to learn about Max today. Uh, unfortunately, this presentation is not going to teach you how to program Max in one hour. However, um, let's talk about the patch cords for a second. So what, what do the patch cords represent? Well, some of them have audio signals going through them. And before MC, the audio patch cord had one channel of audio in it. But now it has up to 1,024 channels. So uh, what's this good for? Well, that's what we're going to try to talk about today. So we're going to do this at the sound design level, not the max. We're not going to teach you how to do this with Mac. So um, we want to get you thinking about audio channels, not just as cables here, but in a, in a different way. Um, so we could use MC to output to lots of audio channels, but like every other presentation, you're probably here at Loop, we're using stereo. Um, and so when we say lots of audio channels, we're not talking about lots of speakers necessarily. And we want to make sure that you don't leave just because you only use stereo. Um, but if you want to, you know, want to hear about surround, we're not going to talk about that today. But you can kind of maybe imagine some of this stuff in, in surround space. So let's start by just talking about how we think about audio channels. So um, here's a. Here, oh, wait. So here's uh, Ableton Live. And uh, if we look at a live set, so you see um, columns, and they're all uh, stereo, right? So basically, whatever happened in those columns got mixed to stereo. So if you had like 16 note synthesizer or whatever it got mixed to stereo, before it got into a column. And then we take all the columns. Oh, we just quit live. Um, we're never actually going to use live again in this. But, um, but anyway, so we mix all the columns to, to some other stereo. So we mix twice, right? First we mix to the columns, and then we mix to the end. So. I want to point out that this design, which is kind of the same way that all the other DAWs work, um, basically makes it impossible to think about audio channels in a creative way. So we're going to do some experiments to think about audio channels in a slightly different way, where we're going to mix all of them together, all just at once at the very end. So we're going to do three uh, areas of experiments. The first we're calling independent note systems. The second is called treating samples as populations. And the third is called parallel effects. And they all have one idea in common, which is thinking about audio channels as a creative space. So what I hope you'll appreciate is that this DAW paradigm of mixing early and often makes it hard to see audio channels this way. And before MC existed, I didn't think of audio channels this way at all. So I just thought they were wires kind of in your computer. So let's see um, what we can do to change our perspective. So we have 12 experiments. We'll probably have at least 12 technical problems along the way. But let's see what happens. So um, the first one uh, is inspired by thinking about pianos. So Real acoustic piano has a lot of strings, hundreds of them, and they're all tuned to 88 different notes. So you probably know that if you hold down the sustain pedal of your piano and scream into it, you will hear the strings start to resonate. So here's an example uh, I recorded at home. And instead of screaming, I just played my melodica into the piano.
So what if we took this idea that strings resonate when you scream into your piano as a conceptual model, and the first way we could do this is to tune 88 filters to the same notes as we have on a piano and then just play something through the filters. So that's what the first example does. So this is a uh, brushes sound that comes with Max. So I've uh, started off the sample here and some of you have used Max before will probably be familiar with it, but now I'm gonna turn this dry wet and I'm gonna route the same signal over to our MC portion of the patcher. You notice this kind of uh, 12 note keyboard octave here and we've got some presets These are undampened notes. Now, so the red notes are the ones that are, we took the dampers off and they're playing through those. And it's, you'll still, it's still the same sample. So we just made the um, cue of the filter a little sharper, and then we can mix the drums back in. Very nice, attractive thing. So um, we're not going to talk too much about how MC works, but one, one thing that's kind of cool is just to see. Uh, so keep it going, and then put, put the, um, well, we don't. So put the um, mouse, unlock it, and put the mouse over the, um, the 16 there. All right, so there's actually 88 uh, audio signals there, and we can look at them. Um, here's like, um, if we, uh, yeah, so here you can see that these are the, um, the ones that are actually playing right now that are undamped. It just shows you 16 at a time so that you don't get overwhelmed. Um, so just a couple of observations about this, which um, I won't make about the other ones, which is, so all of this was completely possible before, but it was a lot of patching 88 times. But now the patch actually looks really simple because there are 88 audio channels in these big blue patch cords. So um, I would never have tried this before, um, but I was able to think of it because Basically, the system made it possible to actually make it. So that's the first idea. The second thing is, um, once you have this thing that has 88 things inside of it, it becomes easier to treat it as a single thing. So if I have to go and tweak 88 things, I'll, I, I just won't do it. But if I have one thing and I can then just apply like one idea to that, it's much more likely that I'll um, think about this. So th those are two ways that this system seems to help encourage thinking about lo lots of audio channels as a um, big creative space. So the next one is, um, is another way of thinking about independent systems. So in this case, we don't have a piano, but we have a kind of a string sound. And so we're not going to listen to the the string part of the piano resonating, but we're going to think about the action of the of the piano. So, this one we um, <coughs> we have a um, a way of playing this um, plucked string simulation named after its two inventors, Carplus and Strong. And we're going to basically we've got an independent one of these systems for every note. So we can basically treat it like a harp, kind of. So Tom's going to perform a little bit on the, on the um, keyboard in the wrong, uh, the wrong direction to make a harp glissando. So 
So the visualizer here down is representative of the, the node I'm playing. As you'll see from the case slider here at the top. And if we switch back to the seaboard, now I'm gonna increase the decay and the dampen. And we have this broken harp switch here for uh, your prepared piano style. So again, that, this broken thing would be really hard to do if these weren't totally independent because they're all, every one of them has their own pian uh, parameters and the parameters stay the same for every note. So every time, every time it would be the same. So um, again, it's like thinking of, of these independent systems was uh, a way of think, thinking about that kind of implementation. Okay, so this one, now we're gonna pretend that we, uh, we are designing vocoders. So if you think about a piano, it's kind of like a vocoder for your hands. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is, instead of uh, playing the, the piano, we're going to drive this vocoder with a recorded sound, and then we're going to put it through a kind of spectrum analyzer and then use the energy in various parts of the spectrum to drive sound in all these different audio channels and then mix them all back together. So the first one we're going to uh, use just sine waves um, and you'll see why kind of at the end. But um, first we should mention the uh, play the original because you'll be hearing the original a lot in our various examples so you should get used to it. Um. At the diner on the corner, I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee, and he fills it okay, only so then halfway. If we, uh... So now we're going to do the I same as before. <clears throat> we're going to dry wet over to the MC corner. section of the patcha. And we're, we're not going to hear her again. So. Goodbye, Suzanne. So these are basically, these different presets that Tom's going to do are different combinations of scales and uh, performance parameters of, of this algorithm. So preset uh, four, five, six, seven here is a different scale transformation. You'll see the scale section down here change. So see if you can hear the words in the different presets. There's the smiley face uh, preset. This one, this is the whole tone one. Actually, you can really, if you listen to this for a while, you can really hear the words. The uh, Suzanne Vega merry-go-round. So this one's kind of like the robot voice version. And now we can actually transpose these messages here. And we have this switch over here, so we can uh, switch to equal temperament. Or non-equal temperament. Non-equal temperament. And then I added these, uh, <laughs> these other things here that I didn't tell you about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So this is a uh, turns turns her into a kind of bass, and then uh, I know you've all been waiting for the electronic chipmunk. All right. 
Okay, so here's the same, uh, the next one, basically the same kind of patch. It's uh, Suzanne Vega through this uh, spectrum analyzer, but instead of triggering with sine waves, we're going to go back to triggering the car plus strong string sound with the, uh, with the recorded sound. So um, one of the things that's interesting in the different presets here is the rate at which we re-trigger the string sound. Um, and so when we trigger more often, it's going to be closer to the original. But when we trigger less often, it becomes this sort of zen environment that kind of vaguely is suggested by the original. Um, so uh, we won't play the original, because I think you know what that uh, sounds like. But here's the slower retriggering. There's a little bit of broken harp action going on in here too. Again, we have this uh, switch to equal temperament. And here on uh, this point up here, we have the rate of triggering. Sounds a lot like the piano I uh, learned on at my piano teacher sometimes. And then this point here, we can change the frequency bin that's being the low point of the frequency bin that's been analyzing the sound for us. This is like you just fired all the people who uh, we're playing the low notes. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, part one. Now part two, we're going to deal with samples um, and sort of more uh, timbral and compositional ideas in lots of uh, audio channels. So there are two sounds I want to play for you that were kind of ins inspiring for me. Uh, First was uh, from when I was in junior high. Uh, there's this song, I'm Not In Love by 10CC. And the background chorus of this song was uh, totally amazing to me. So here's a br brief excerpt of, of the part where there's a lot of background chorus, if you're not familiar with this. Uh. So uh, the story of how this song was created, which uh, you can read more about on Wikipedia if you want, but is actually an example of a parallel independent system. So each note of the chromatic scale was recorded with 48 overdubbed vocals, which was basically three guys singing overdubbed. Them, they overdubbed themselves 16 times. And they did this onto gi giant tape loops. And then each of these independent tape loops was going and then to play a note, they would uh, turn up the gain on one of the channels of a 12-channel mixing board. So this was, remember, this is like 1974, before there's digital audio or MIDI or anything like that. So it's pretty a uh, pretty ingenious idea. Um, now, if we go into the digital domain, uh, another sound that's really fascinated me was the THX deep note that plays before the movies. And that was created by Andy Moore. The sound has been getting a little bit more publicity lately, much of it driven by THX itself, uh, including you can see Moore's score for the, the, the piece and uh, some cool stories of how he actually made it. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But for now, just think of it as 50 or 60 independently changing samples 
but they're not changing exactly at the same time, but according to a design that kind of exists across this entire space of samples. So this is an early example of thinking of audio channels as a, as a big space. It starts out kind of random, but then turns into one giant chord. I'm more interested actually in the random part. But. Okay, so now where's the movie? Uh, so there, these both are kind of in this conceptual space that we'll be looking at. So the first experiment, we're gonna look at how we actually perceive lots of sound sources. So before we play this demo, this doesn't actually use samples, so I wanna warn you that we're just using sort of pure tones and they might be a little hard in your ears, so uh, we'll, we'll try to keep the volume down, but um, we wanna use pure tones to, to look at some of the factors that contribute to how we perceive multiple sound sources. So we're just gonna use four channels of audio for this and see how many oscillators you actually hear in the, as we uh, switch through these different presets. And it's worth pointing out that in this demo, the visualization is actually of the four individual channels that are combined in the, the one MC patch cable. So just right now you'll see they're kind of phase locked, but you just keep an eye on that as well as the sound. Okay, so here we've uh, basically put the, um, the phase of the, um, those four oscillators that are modulating the sound, they're now out of phase. So suddenly we, we start to hear more than one. At first we thought it was just one sound. So now um, they're back together and we made the d depth of the vibrato different for each of them. So it's subtly like more than one sound, but it's really kind of just one sound. And then four, um, it's the same as three, but we've decorrelated the phase again. So then you hear kind of more than one. Um, and then now we've randomized the frequency of the vibrato for each of the four. So you're starting to hear a stronger effect of multiple sources and then Tom made this one. It's just completely random of uh, everything. And um, it's interesting, like, I'll stop talking for a second. See how many, do you hear more than four, less than four? It's kind of weird, huh? Okay, so the next example, um, we're gonna take a sound that's uh, by itself sort of boring and uh, innocuous and then finds out what, what happens uh, as you mix more and more of the same sound together. Um, so we have a, to relieve the boredom, we have this kind of fun visualizer. Uh, yeah, it's what, inspired, what's actually going on there? Uh, it's inspired by the, the guys outside the used car lots. With the <laughs> uh, but uh, actually each, each uh, channel, there's 20 in total in these MC patch cables is represented in this visual. So right now you're seeing the representation of a single uh, channel within the MC patch cable. Okay, so here's the boring sound. It's just kind of this random, like siren-y tea kettle whistling thing. And now he's, uh, changed it so that it only plays equal temperament notes. Um, but now we're gonna start adding more uh, channels into it. So that's 20. That's 50. And 80. Visualizer's going crazy. And here we can, uh, we switch again out of equal temperament. So we kind of got a, a wind effect here. And now we can actually scale back those voices.
back to our so would you have predicted from listening to that that it would have sounded like the thing um, with 80 copies of it? It's kind of interesting. It, um, it's also interesting to see like the, the change between 1 and, and 80 is not linear, right? So the difference between 50 and 80 is kind of not, there wasn't that much of a change. Um, <coughs> So, but there's a big there's a big difference between four and twenty, for example. So, there's no rule of thumb that I can think of for this. Uh, it seems to be different for each of these, and you'll see some some of these have hundreds of channels, some of them just have twenty. Uh, but uh, it's kind of something that you can experiment just by typing another number, which is kind of amazing. Okay, so. We're going to um, continue with this idea of applying large numbers of changes across a uh, population of channels. But in this case, instead of doing those changes all at once, we're going to introduce a delay uh, while, we while we change things. So we have, in this case, we have 60 samples that we're going to be playing and mixing together. And we can change the playback speed of the samples and we can change the playback speed of each sample independently. And so what we'll do is we'll propagate a, a change in pitch of, of the sample, basically, over a certain amount of time. And you'll hear some of these ch properties change immediately, and some of them uh, take effect over, uh, over a longer period. So we have a, uh, two visualizers here. One is a scope-like uh, representation, like an oscilloscope of all 60 channels. And the other is a multi-slider object, which is representative of every channel in the audio stream as well. It's just on a, and it's actually the, the channels decay. Oh, so the, yeah, the red one is, is, so we're not actually listening to the uh, output of the audio, we're listening to what's driving the the sample, basically. So it's like a phase phase representation, and you'll see that correlating and uncorrelating phase is what's cool about this. So, so now I'm actually going to recorrelate the phase, and uh, you'll notice this in the visualizer. So now it's all of them are basically. It just sounds like one sound, right? Because there's no basic difference in how they're being um, changed. And these messages here, I'll slowly decorrelate all of the channels further. You'll notice the multi slider gets more kind of disconnected, each of the channels in it. You can also see the phase here in the uh, scope offsetting further with the decorrelation. So here you can hear the new, this kind of orchestration effect of the new pitch coming in over the population over time. Now in this, this next one, we're going to go from a higher uh, pitch to a lower pitch and listen carefully as it sounds basically like uh, one of the performers was asleep and finally woke up and realized that we were supposed to be singing a different tone. So, um, it's kind of a harsh discontinuity at the very end of this change. just cut off, right? So this is where you adjust it. So here's a, um, basically the, the effect of introducing this kind of randomness around the bass pitch, which we call deviation. It's sort of the uh, um, Bulgarian women's choir effect. Sounds really good when you go back to. Okay, so the next one is uh <laughs> the 
the next one I've titled, uh, What is Reverb? So this is a, um, if you, any of you saw the Max 8 demo movie that, that Tom uh, did, um, there was, this patch was used in it, and one of the things that uh, we experimented with while we were making it was we added a slider to be able to change the pitch, which is the same kind of pitch effect that you heard in the previous patch. Um, but we could change it really fast, and suddenly I was like, that sounds like reverb. But there is no reverb. It's just the, the sort of shadow of the change over the population that's happening more slowly than, than you would otherwise hear. So this one is just set up basically for Tom to move this slider back and forth. And, um, and you'll hear this effect, I think. Try going down too slowly. So uh, basically, it makes me realize that uh, you hear a lot of these reverb effects when you work with lots and lots of channels, which I had no idea what happened. So it's a, it's kind of like a, a shadow, as I said. It, basically, you have the, the new sound, which reflects the most current change in pitch. And then, but the old one is still kind of there, but it's not quite as loud, because more of the population has gone to the new setting. So you can basically think of reverb maybe in a more general and conceptual way as some mix of of what's happening now and what happened in the, in the recent past or something like that, which is, again, something I would never have stumbled upon unless I somehow started playing with lots of audio channels in this way. So the uh, next one is kind of just a, uh, well, the, I don't know what to call it, but it's a, um, essentially kind of inspired by the THX deep note and one of the things I heard when Andy Moore was talking about how he made this, and there's a, two really interesting episodes of this podcast called 20,000 Hertz, where he talks about the construction of the, of the sound. And one of the things he says is that it's basically a cello sample, if you can believe it, and he's got 30 or 40 copies of it, and he's just changing the pitch of the cello sample once a second. What he doesn't say, which should be more obvious from some of the examples that we've been playing, is that those changes are not happening synchronously, but they're all decorrelated. So um, this is kind of a thing inspired by decorrelated changes. And some of the changes are synchronized and some are decorrelated, but it actually didn't make that much difference. So I kind of went in a different direction with it. And it's more about, I don't know what it's about. So we'll just play with it, and, and you'll kind of hear a uh, similar space maybe to to uh, these other ones, but it, it's different in some way, so. So one thing that's going on here, so there's basically four pitches basically that's choosing from uh, across this population of 100 channels, and um, then it's also picking a random octave uh, at the same time. And then we increase the number of notes that we pick from to 13. And then here's all 36 that we're picking from. Here's a chromatic scale. Sounds like an organ. And this is the one where you change the... So this is a, um, the spacey effect, which is basically introducing a slight randomness in the pitch. Um, <clears throat> so here we've actually switched the table. You'll notice the table changed from here to actually all be selecting from the same note. And if I individually select new points in the table, 
you'll hear new, new voices. Essentially giving the MC channels more options to choose from. And again, we have a kind of new addition here called the grid meter, where I'm able to uh, slowly decrease the amount of voices that you can hear. So it's pretty lame with just one. <laughs> to put it simply. <laughs> All right, so uh, now we're to part three. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, what we call a multi-channel effect. So all of these, we, um, we're going to basically take one one sound, copy it a bunch of times, and then throw it into the same effect, but um, change that, sp that effect across the space of, of the channels. So the first couple of examples, we're going to see what happens when we transform a sound with large numbers of modulating delays. So the first one, we're going to use a sample of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring that's been shipping with Max for decades, it feels like. And we're going to play 50 copies of this sample through 50 different all-pass filters. An all-pass filter is basically a short delay where the filtering effect is ach achieved by f superimposing the delayed sound on top of the original. But we don't really care what the all-pass filter sounds like. We just care that we can mess with it. So as you'll hear, it has some rather curious properties. So the first preset, I think, starts with basically what the original kind of sounds like. It's a little bit modulated, but... Again, the visualizer is a little different here, but it's representative of all of the channels in one mesh. You might notice that it's subtly moving already. So um, the difference between two, go back to two for a sec. So basically you hear the sound going back and forth in stereo, and I have no idea why it's doing this, but what I do know is that basically the modulation is pretty much correlated, and then when we go to three, this, this next one, it, um, all the modulation is decorrelated, so it's not moving exactly. And that's all you had to do to get that to happen. So now we're increasing the modulation frequency, and this seems to have this weird effect of making the sound more percussive, where it was previously just a string orchestra. And it be eventually becomes a marching army or something like that. Um, so this one's very interesting. Listen to this for a second. It feels like there's a bunch of them all going at different speeds or something like that. Um, and that's the, is that the one where you solo it? Yeah, I think so. So here's what one of them sounds like. And then go back to the... F <laughs> and that's with 50. And then finally, we have our little dubstep effect here. David was insistent on putting the dubstep in. OK, so the next one, uh, we've already shown some reverb. But now we're going to try to do something that's closer to genuine reverb, but it really isn't reverb. Um, it's uh, basically just 250 delays, all set to different times that are somewhat mathematically related. 
And I should say at the beginning, I don't know anything about making reverb. So this is basically someone just screwing around with audio channels. The thing about reverb, though, is what we typically think it means is that you have a sound source, and then my sound bounces off a wall, and then it bounces off that wall, and then comes back. And all of these things that you hear, these reflections, contribute to a sense of reverberation in a space. And if you're in an anechoic chamber, not, there's no bouncing, and it sounds weird, because we actually hear a lot of the sound coming off the wall, not just coming directly from the source. Well, in this example, it's kind of like 200, it's like 250 things going into an anechoic chamber, because there's no feedback on any of these delays. It's just the delay. And so this gives a very weird, uh, kind of uncanny effect to what it's, you think is reverb, but then once you kind of look at it more closely, it's not. So, um, as with the other example that we just played, the LFOs uh, in that one, when we correlate them and decorrelate them, are, it's very dramatically different. So you'll hear that in this example as well. We can modulate all 250 of these delays independently, and in certain cases, we will, we will correlate them and, and not, and you may not believe what you've been hearing. <laughs> so um, let's go back to our favorite uh, source material here and play it through uh, so-called reverb. <laughs> so this is kind of a bigger space. Um, but listen to what happens, just uh, leave it on that for a second, just listen to what, it, what happens when she pauses and you'll hear this weird reverb that just stops. This is the best right here. So here's a smaller space, a little bit more modulation. There's another variation of that. So I think this is the one, if you... Okay, so now we've, we've made all of the modulations correlated. Now they're a little bit uncorrelated, and they're fully back to the... Changing the balance of the delays. Maybe on the next one. This will be more obvious. So here we have this other effect where one of the dimensions of reverb quality is um, how, you, how you have certain delays louder than others. So we have this little thing where we can set a kind of range of the, the lowest and highest volume for the delays. It's very striking at the, it's kind of intense and unpleasant at the, when it's at the top and then feels more palatable as it gets bigger or something. So that's like nicer, but just, just have it like way at the end there. It's like bad reverb. Okay, so here's where we can turn singing into shouting with a... Uh, And then we have shouting in a smaller space. But now he, oh, go back to this one. And now, uh, yeah, so if you correlate them, that's what it sounds like. And then here, we're back to the glee club. This is where we have a subtle kind of voice doubling effect. If you listen closely, you can hear like a second Suzanne tailing. So 
almost like all she does is gets the sibilant type sounds or something. Number two. Okay, so we have one more abuse of Suzanne. Uh, and uh, this one is uh, basically uh, MC has the ability to load lots of audio plugins and then feed the same same sound into lots of them. So I wondered what, what, what would happen if I took a Max for Live device I created a long time ago called Noise Kipper that um, has a DSP algorithm, which I have to make the quote sign for because basically all it does is multiply a signal by noise, which is totally wrong from every perspective of audio quality. But it turns out this plugin has a devoted user base who enjoy transforming signals with multiplying noise. And uh, they can use it in subtle, but mostly unsubtle ways, as you'll hear. So um, let's see what happens with uh, 20 copies of this noisy plugin. So this is this. This is actually the subtle. Uh, also here, just keep an eye on the grid meter because it will show you when the signal is kind of clipping. You'll notice some red dots start to appear. So Tom's adjusting now the um, basically the spread of the noise frequencies over the 20 plugins. So we're turning Suzanne into a black metal vocalist here. Now we're really getting there. Let's watch the grid meter here, it's clipping in areas. This one sounds like someone's whispering in an Irish accent if you look, listen really closely. So here I can actually send a message to the grid meter and I can solo each of the MC channels. So you'll hear actually how they're all individually different. All 20 of them. Se seven. seven is awesome. Sounds like someone in a lot of pain. <laughs> 13 is pretty good. And then back to uh, all 20. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we just have the 10cc song. So you can hear, it's actually, it's, even though it sounds abusive and noisy, it's quite interesting when you put different sounds through what, what ends up getting picked up. So those are 48 voices through this 20 plugins. Okay, so last example, we want to think about samplers. And uh, so instead of talking about a real piano, let's think about a sampled piano. So samplers mix all their samples together, but wouldn't it be cool if you could take an individual note of every from a sampler and send it to a different audio channel? So, well, we can do that because we can load 24 copies of Contact into Max. <laughs> and um, so each of these, basically, we're going to control. We have this uh, C board here, and we're going to basically assign every single note of the seaboard to a, a different channel of a sampler, or a different sampler. 
and that sampler is on a different audio channel, and then it has its own delay effect. So, because basically the Seaboard is an expressive instrument, but there's nothing you can really do with a, a piano sample other than play it louder. So, uh, what we can do now is apply the expression of the keyboard to the echo of the note rather than the uh, sample itself. So, um, I've mapped, let's see, we have um, the aftertouch of each note is the feedback delay, so we can make a kind of tremolo effect with that. Um, there's pitch bend, which is kind of delay time, so you'll hear like pitch effects uh, per channel. And then, um, that's about it, right? Yeah. Um, oh, and then there's a, um, the master pitch bend uh, is the low note. So, um, so uh, but the uh, idea is that the number of notes that you hold down determines the delay time. So there's a bass delay time, and then if I just play one note, it's, yeah, yeah. And then if I uh, play a second note, it's uh, like three against two. And then as I hold down more notes, the delay time is, a, is the increased subdivision until we get to six, at which time it starts over uh, back at the first one. But I don't know if I can actually hold six notes down at the same time. So, so I'll try to, this is uh, unlike the other ones where we don't really have a um, prepared thing, so I'm just gonna perform this a little bit um, to give you an anticlimactic thing after your tra trauma of hearing a lot of filtered noise. So. <laughs> 